Hello and welcome to the fifth instalment of the Stoics. So this week we're going to be looking at Marcus Aurelius and um, perhaps the ultimate Stoic, the Stoic who comes to mind immediately when we think of this remarkable tradition. Um, so my name is Dan Taylor and I guess over the next hour or so I, I wish to um, not only give you um, a clear outline of what Marcus Aurelius has to say and why he says it, um, but also to try and persuade you if you're not persuaded already that um, this is um, th this should be counted as um, among one of the greatest works of literature, perhaps not philosophy, but certainly of human expression that we have available. Um, the goal is to unpack this and to kind of see its specific elements. And maybe as we go along, I'll see if I can persuade you into it, into loving this as much as I do. OK, right. The agenda is as follows. Here is a rather evocative looking image of Marcus. Um, we're going to begin by talking about who Marcus Aurelius was um, and this will be interesting to kind of then ask the question about how much of Marcus the Emperor um, is reflected in the meditations or not. We're then going to look at the format of this book as it survives uh, to us. We're going to think about um, its ordering and, and a little bit about its purpose as well. Um, then over the next following two parts, I want us to kind of look at two different aspects of what the meditations are doing. Um, and I've, I've split them into two because I kind of see two different um, imperatives and that emerge from this work. One is detachment. I think that's pretty clear when we're reading this, um, but also duty. Duty and what it means to be a part of the whole and what that means for you and what as an emperor or as a human being, um, how you should relate to offers and I think uh, Marcus has some very interesting things to say about compassion here too but let's not forget detachment and is what is being advocated here too cold too detached uh, we're then in the final part we're going to look at his legacy but not in great depth but I'm going to set out here um, a, a, a new consideration about how we place the Stoics so far in the history of philosophy we're going to look at um, uh, Ernest Renan, and then we're going to look at a remark by the philosopher Hegel. Um, okay, right, first of all, we're going to meet Marcus, Marcus Aurelius. Okay, right. So, here he is. We'll have to just make do with statues, but I'm going to show you um, a recreation of what he might have looked like in a moment, and it's not Joaquin Phoenix in the film Gladiator. It's possibly more accurate. Okay, let's just go over the facts about Marcus Aurelius and his life. Uh, and then we'll get into how we place this book. So, Marcus is born in the year 121 CE, 121 AD. Uh, he's born in Rome. Now, he becomes emperor. This is perhaps the, over, the key fact <laughs> with his life. But at least at this stage, he, at least in terms of how he is born and the family that he's born into, there's not an expectation yet that he will become emperor. It's not, don't imagine this like say a, a British monarchy where you know one child uh, the ruler's um, biological firstborn son ends up becoming ruler this is what happens actually with Marcus Aurelius's son but when he's born it's not clear but what's his family like what's his background like well you can probably guess it's quite different to Epictetus uh, the rude and cheeky admonishing slave who we met last week uh, Marcus is born into a wealthy family and his family own a number of brick factories but not just wealth, they also have a lot of political influence. Now this influence really does carry. Uh, so Marcus's father dies when he is just aged three, um, but he's then adopted by his grandfather, Marcus Annius Verus. But what is decisive for our, our man's life is that he is noticed by the Emperor Hadrian at a very young age. Um, at the age of six, um, Hadrian appoints him to the equestrian order. This is the order of knights. Um, it's you know it's it's high class. Um, and then not only that, Hadrian then um, when Hay the emperor Hadrian, we think of Hadrian's Wall in Britain. When Hadrian is managing who is going to succeed him as emperor, he appoints this guy called um, Antoninus Pius. But he says to Antoninus. Um, that he must in turn adopt and appoint Marcus to be the successor of him. So what does this mean at this early stage? Well, I guess we're, probably, we're getting the impression that um, 
not just in terms of his family, but maybe in terms of his um, his intellectual or political abilities, he's noticed at a young age, um, and he is kind of prepared for power. So Marcus is given the role of quaestor um, at the age of 23. What's that, you're wondering? It's like a, an important public official. It's, um, you know, it might be nowadays a bit like um, becoming a special advisor to an MP. You know, you, you're a spad, but you know, you're, gonna, you're probably next stage for you, you're going to be, um, if you play your cards right, uh, you'll be um, airdropped into a safe seat. And this is kind of what happens for Marcus. He then becomes a consul in the year 130. Um, and yeah, and then and then he is kind of, because he's adopted by Antoninus Pius, who's he? There he is. Um, he is kind of, his education um, as, a, as a teenager and as a young man is very much about preparing and equipping him um, for the, the very heights of political power. Now, Antoninus Pius, should we say a bit about him? Maybe we should. Um, this is an image of um, him um, of kind of going up to heaven. And here are some coins from his reign. Um, I guess the things that we should keep in mind here with Antoninus um, is that he was considered generally quite a good ruler, uh, quite a good emperor, and Marcus has a lot of good things to say about him. Um, Marcus himself becomes emperor in year 161 CE. If you're trying to keep track of the dates here, basically um, he's age 40 when he becomes emperor, when Antoninus dies. Um, now, Hadrian has um, has asked Antoninus um, to um, appoint uh, two co-emperors at the same time, and this was a fairly common practice. It's a good way of managing political factions and um, dynasties and families within the Roman Empire that you rather than have everything on one emperor, you have two at the same time. So actually, Marcus, when he's appointed um, emperor, um, he co-rules um, with Lucius, so I think is the actual son of Antoninus. So they're they're both the co-emperors at the same time, and they rule together for about eight years. And then Lucius dies, probably of the plague. We'll talk more about the plague in a second. So Antoninus is kind of his uh, Marcus's adopted father prepares him for rule. And if you have read um, not just a bit of the meditations that I set you to read this week, which is books two, three and four, but book one, which it sets out on this really powerful note of gratitude, um, Marcus there thanks Antoninus in quite a lot of detail. And he says, well, this is actually from a, a little bit elsewhere in the meditations. He's kind of remembering about what a good influence he was. And he says, do all things as a disciple of Antoninus. Think of his constancy in every act rationally undertaken, his invariable equability note here that antoninus is having a lot of key stoic virtues attributed to him the quote continues his piety his serenity of countenance his sweetness of disposition his contempt for the bubble of fame and his zeal for getting a true grasp of affairs what you could also do when you are looking at book one let's say you haven't looked at it yet but you do um and this is i'll talk about this image more in a second what I would suggest to you is when you read him talking about Antoninus's adopted father, have in mind here the ways in which some of our previous writers like Epictetus, like Seneca, have described the Stoic philosopher or the, the wise man in different ways. So um, this is just a, a theatre that was built at the time. We're going to say a lot more about ruins actually in a second. Um, so what happens in Marcus's life? So he's emperor in 161. OK, great. Um, what's his personal life like so far as we can tell? Well, he's married to um, the daughter of Antoninus. Her name is Faustina, and they have 13 children. Now, some of you might know this already. Not all these children survive. In fact, not many of them do. Five daughters and only one son survive into adulthood. So that's six, seven pass away. And the son who does survive is a complete gobshite, Commodus, um, and we'll say more about him in a moment. Um, so what's this world like in which Marcus and originally his uh, Lucius are ruling and then it's him just on his own? What's happening in the Roman Empire at this point? Let's have a look at a map. Well, it's pretty vast. Um, we can see that this is a, a Mediterranean Empire. And at least in this period, and it kind of goes into decline later, if you look at the very east, the very far right of this map, you'll see Pavia. 
Now on the Trajan who had been around I think like 60 years before this map 110 CE um, uh, Trajan had um, extended the Roman Empire out to Mesopotamia which is vast and then but then it's kind of this, this area is lost the little and Pavia on the far right um, is kind of resurging and, and this is and they're starting to attack into the eastern part of the Roman Empire there's a lot of instability basically and so Marcus basically is having to deal with a lot of crises you know from the moment he begins ruling um, so and it kind of begins from the very outset so remember he becomes emperor in year 161 in that same year the river Tiber which runs through Rome completely floods and there's also a major famine as if that wasn't bad enough you know floods and famines there's also a major earthquake the same year and then there's another earthquake about 17 years later. So you've got all these natural disasters. And what you've also got um, are these kind of uprisings like that in Pavia. Um, in fact, all of the eastern provinces, there's all of it's kind of continual war and, and disorder. And later on, it's going to be in the north, the border. If you look at this map here, where you've got the kind of the various Roman uh, regions, and then it just kind of goes grey above, Germania, Inferior, this is kind of battle line. Um, is where Marcus is going to sp end up spending a lot of time towards the end of his life. At least in terms of the uprisings that are in the east, and this is just enough a map, but it's got all those annoying um, watermarks on, um, the uprisings in Pavia. Um, you know, so Marcus, you know, they get to go out to crush, you know, these impudent rebels. Um, but what happens in the end um, is it, it, the legions who would end up coming back to Rome bring with them a plague. And so you've got your flood and your famine and your earthquake, and then you have a major plague which kills possibly up to 18 million people across the Roman Empire um, from the year 166, and it just goes on in years after. Eventually even Marcus dies, possibly of the same plague. Uh, there's an insurrection <laughs> in the year 173 CE. So basically it's, it's turbulence, it's, it's disorder, it's war. Um, and maybe that kind of fits, you know, so it's a blessing that um, that somebody so philosophically inclined is the emperor during this period, because many other emperors would have probably been overthrown through making um, unwise decisions that were designed to prop up their own power base in the short term. Marx is, is kind of known and fated, even in his own life, as somebody um, who is a very wise and capable ruler. And we'll hear some more remarks about this in a second. We do actually, in um, the meditations, get reference to some of these military campaigns, um, the Quadi and the Marco Mani. Who are the Quadi and the Marco Mani? Well, they're just some of the many tribes um, of the Germanic peoples that we might see on this map, um, who are kind of threatening um, Roman rule. Now, if you're thinking here, threatening Roman rule, does this mean that they want to assassinate the emperor and, and take over like this? No, not quite. It's more the case that these Germanic peoples are kind of pushing back against Roman incursions. And, that, and around this time, they're also being displaced from migrations that are coming further east. So we have this like border instability, and Marcus is often on these military uh, campaigns, you know, fighting in the east and then fighting in the north and so on. Um, one of his top generals, Avidius Cassius, um, ends up saying, hi, I'm the emperor now, I'm going to rule, he rebels. And so this um, revolt ends up getting put down to, oh, it's just a, lot, a great deal of instability. Maybe when we're thinking about the meditations and it's um, admonishments to, um, you know, to be wary of flatterers, to be suspicious of regal power, um, to, um, to, to recognise that life is transient and fleeting and precarious. This itself reflects a very turbulent period, a very turbulent um, time, and a, and a life that, you know, kind of balances these fluctuations like a river. And Marcus often uses this analogy of like water, like a river. So maybe we can read the time into this. I promised you an image of what he, artists think he looked like, maybe maybe a little bit like this. It's a prominent equestrian, this is literally equestrian, he's on a horse statue in Rome. Um, but yeah, somebody's taken one of the most uh, well-known busts of Marcus and they've reconstructed his face. This might be what he looked like. Okay. Um, so, the facts of Marcus Aurelius's life. 
as so far as we know them. Oh, and Commodus. Um, should we talk about Commodus? Yeah, let's talk about Commodus. <laughs> okay, Commodus. I haven't got a picture of Joaquin Phoenix in the film Gladiator by Russell Crowe. You'll just have to keep that one in mind. Um, but one of the ways in which Marcus is also remembered is that, um, and this maybe it's interesting actually. This is one that we can talk about at the very end. Um, previous emperors had kind of played it so that rather than their biological children and succeeding them as the emperor, they ended up appointing an adopted son and they would rule instead, usually because you know they would, might be more capable and more popular and so on. But Marcus doesn't do this. He, his son, Commodus, his biological son, ends up becoming the next emperor. They co-rule together for a bit, and but then Marcus dies. Um, and Commodus ends up ruling for quite a long time, and he is just—he's kind of remembered for being a bit for the, um, for being very, very poor, you know, characteristically for any kind of tyrant. Um, maybe that's interesting too, that we we often think of Marcus as a wise ruler, but maybe the very institution of having an emperor of ruling over such a vast territory is always a kind of madness, and it's always inevitable that it, it would collapse into civil war because tyranny itself cannot last stably or it cannot last more than a few decades. Anyway, Commodus, he, um, as you'll know from the film Gladiator, uh, he, wasn't, um, he wasn't particularly interested in running the country or understanding how it worked, the country, I should say the empire, running the empire knowing how it worked. He used to enjoy gladi gladiatorial battles. He'd often fight against animals and other gladiators, um, except for they all, basically all of his opponents were forced to let him win. He ends up deifying himself like Hercules. That's basically what's going off in these images here. He's, he's made himself like Hercules. And then on these, these coins from the time period, you can see Hercule, um, you know, the allusions to Hercules, basically. Sorry, you're probably looking for a more academic answer there, but you can tell with the club and so forth. So, right now the facts of Marcus Aurelius' life. Um, so his years, 121 to 180. Emperor for 19 years, um, it's a turbulent reign. He is sometimes seen as the, the, the last of the five uh, good Roman emperors, and this distinction I think comes from Machiavelli. Machiavelli, an important political theorist, but somebody who was also a Roman historian and would dress up in Roman robes when he wrote his histories. Um, because it all basically goes downhill from here. Um, there's a couple of sources that give us a flavour of the appreciation of Marx's philosophical bent from his own times. One is kind of a slightly dubious source, but it seems to have been written in the later part of the Roman Empire, the Historia Augusta. Um, we don't know who the author authors of it were, but um, it's like a history of, of like, a, a series of Roman emperors. And from that, we hear that Marcus Aurelius was, quote, devoted to philosophy as long as he lived and preeminent among emperors in purity of life. And this kind of purity comes up again in another slightly more reputable Roman historian, Cassius Dio. And Cassius here is basically saying that, you know, Marcus, um, he had a bad life. Um, and, um, you know, it's actually this is reminiscent of what Seneca has to say that, you know, adversity trains us. Adversity is good. It makes you a stronger wrestler. Cassius admires him because of the way that he um, remained himself amidst all these disasters. Let's hear what Cassius has to say. He didn't have the luck which he deserved but was confronted throughout his reign by a multitude of disasters. That is why I admire him more than any other, for it was amidst these extraordinary and unparalleled difficulties that we, he was able to survive and save the empire. empire. This is intriguing, isn't it, to save the empire? And it kind of plays into the image um, that wise rule um, is always a blessing, that wise rule will save us. Plato talked about the philosopher kings, here we have a philosopher emperor. The question remains though, how much of this context and this world is present in the meditations? Now you're probably thinking of some examples, there are bits and bobs. He does mention about you know, being resisting the allure of the purple, he warns against um, Caesarizing himself, it's translated in different ways, like becoming a, a Caesar in the sense of become seeing yourself as a kind of god. Remember Roman emperors were deified. Um, but then it's different, you know, so there is, there are some elements of this here, there are, you know, there's a passing reference which some commentators make a great deal about of the Sarmatians and how he, you know, he sees them as not human, these, you know, these are one of the many tribes that he's warring against at the time. 
but the meditations um it's um it's like in 473 sections and just under 500 sections uh according to one count less than 40 deal with the imperial experience um so it doesn't come up very often um and usually it's in these kind of reminders to not get um eaten up um with the power with the law just one quote this is from book five remember that where life is possible then it is possible to live a good life life is possible in a palace so it is possible to live the good life even in a palace you can, well, it's, it's kind of negotiation, isn't it? You saw this in Seneca. What do you do with wealth? For a stoic training, wealth is an indifferent. We shouldn't, um, oh, we, uh, we should desire to be wealthy. But at the same time, to not be wealthy, to be, you know, desperately poor in the way that the cynics advised is not going to help the wise man either. You know, it's going to be a bit of a distraction because you're not going to be able to fulfill your material needs. In that sense, the stoics are always kind of on playing a middle ground that's reminiscent more of Aristotle than than the cynics of say like Diogenes and so on. So those elements, I mean there are bits where he is talking about um not uh, not being um deluded about the insecurity of his position. But at the same time I think what makes the meditation so timeless and why people often come back to it is because and this I imagine in our discussion on Monday I'm gonna get a lot of flack for what I'm about to say. Um, but much of it could be written by anybody. Much of it could be written by anyone looking out on a world defined by instability and flux um, and risk and making, uh, admonishing themselves and making a decision, making decisions about themselves, about how they should live, that they're going to recognize that life is short, that they're going to try and make the most of the present, that they're going to see that life all is vanity. But then that's not going to lead them into a kind of um, suicidal despair like we get, um, like what Albert Camus writes about in the myth of Sisyphus, or you get it in other writers too. It's not going to lead to pessimism because Marcus believes that there is an underlying harmony or logos in the universe, like this is a stoic kind of outlook. Even though people are very flawed, their flaws train us in our own flaws. Now, if we kind of follow Marx's route, which is to cultivate a kind of detachment, but which is then coupled to a sense of duty, that we should almost love others because of their flaws. We should participate in society because we are parts of a whole. Then I think we have something very interesting here. And, this, and it's these elements that I think give the meditations this sense that we could imagine somebody writing or at least thinking a similar series of thoughts in many other time periods. You might disagree. Remember, my, my ulterior goal on this one is to um, persuade you that this isn't just interesting stoic philosophy, it's great philosophy. Um, right, let's, let's say a little bit more about this man and then we're going to talk about the structure of this work. Um, so there's a column to Marcus um, and it's existed for a long time, hence the image on the left. Um, and this is just a close up. Sorry, this is one of those moments where I should start telling you about archaeological history, but I'm just not going to do that. Instead, um, one thing that makes Marcus, um, well, I mentioned this at the very beginning, you know, he is the go-to Stoic, is this kind of wonderful um, style in which he writes, um, which makes his philosophy very engaging and very immediate, and it's very much about how we live, not just about how we think. And so maybe this, this is this proof of a great philosopher. Well, I'm I'm really interested in tattoos anyway. Um, I'm interested in in philosophical tattoos. Normally, per philosopher, you get one or two. With Nietzsche, there no, there's not many range. But with Marcus Aurelius, there are tons of tattoos, usually of him. Um, here you can see some, but of course, very quotations from many from different parts. So he's a. I mean, I use the example of tattoos. Um, to kind of make a point about how he's someone who, who speaks to many different people and who seems to have something to say about how we should live. But not only that, he's someone who you might want to wear on your sleeve in the same way that you might put your heart on your sleeve. You know, why have all these different people? And when I was looking, there's loads of people, Marcus Elwood's tattoos, male and female, actually, not just male. Um, why do all these people wish to make this statement? They wish to put Marcus on their arm. I think it's arms in most of these cases. Um, well, it's a statement about how we live, isn't it? 
a sense of, of detachment, but also in places a love, a love of um, other human beings and a love of nature and a love of the harmony of nature. Okay, let's get into what these meditations are actually doing, the format. So what do you need to know about the format? Well, okay, let's have a look. Here's a title page from an early English edition. Okay, so the meditations. Unlike previous things that we have studied so far, these are, at least so far as we can tell, we don't know to what extent they're even meant to be read. So Epictetus, when we looked at the handbook, the handbook is not written by Epictetus, nor are his discourses on which the handbook is based. They're transcriptions from one of his students, Arian, and probably Epictetus was involved in some way with these transcriptions, but you know, he doesn't choose he doesn't, you know, he doesn't choose to then write his own book after this. But at least with Epictetus, these are these are manuals, these are guidebooks for for young Romans interested in philosophy. Remember Hadrian, the Emperor Hadrian meets Epictetus. Uh, goes to, to meet him in uh, Nicopolis. Seneca, you know, Seneca, Seneca is Seneca is huge in his day. He is, you know, he's a, a major playwright at the centre of political life and a very popular philosopher. This stuff is meant to be read widely. Cicero, the same. Diogenes Laertius, he's a historian, but he's compiling uh, summaries of books that were available in the ancient world by Zeno by uh, Chrysippus, by Cleantes. So all of these, these kind of stoic texts that I'm alluding to, they're things that are available. This is different. It's not published in Marcus's lifetime. It doesn't even really have a title. So it's sometimes called To Himself from the Greek or The Meditations. Um, it's, so it's written in co Koine, conversational Greek, same as um, Epictetus's work. Remember, keep this in mind with Seneca. He's the only guy who's writing in Latin, which I think Cicero is as well. Okay, these two. Um, ah, okay, so it's not written in his life, but it's surely a big deal straight after. No, no, it's not. It's not. It's um, there's a re there's a fleeting reference to Marx's exhortations about two centuries later, um, by a guy called Temistius. But we don't know what he's referring to. He just says, he's just kind of saying, you know, this is a great work, blah, blah, blah. But it's just a mention. And actually, it's only until uh, the 9th and 10th century uh, in Byzantium that we start hearing about the meditation. So let, how, how are we imagining this? What I propose that we imagine is that Marcus Aurelius has a hat, this copy, this notebook, notebooks, scrolls, um, where he's writing these thoughts. And then these are kind of preserved in the archival library, they're copied, copied at, at, at some various points. But we're talking about an 800 year gap, 800, 7, 800 year gap, it's probably copied a couple of times. Um, and, it, and one of these copies ends up being read in Byzantium because this bishop is looking and going, this is very good. He's talking about, he talks about the very profitable book of the Emperor Marcus. Um, book or books, we don't know if he's referring to all of them. You'll notice the 12 book scrolls here because it exists in the form of scrolls. So there's, a bit, so there's a bit of a mention in Byzantium about this, but it still is kind of, it's, its influence is still very minor actually. It's only really in the early modern period that there's a major resurgence. You know what, actually this is true of all I think, because I didn't really give you a historical reception of Epictetus last week because we had so much to cover already. Um, but even Epictetus is kind of rediscovered and refashioned in the, like, I think it's the 17th century. Marcus, it's the mid 16th. There's a Latin translation from Greek to Latin, and then there are loads more translations after this, you know, and this kind of gets us to what we're looking at here, um, this edition. Okay, um, so let's think here about the book. So it's not published in its own time, it only appears much later. Da -da 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 -da. So the form that we have it is that it's divided into 12 books, and, and overall, that um, well, in each book, there's a it varies, some are long, some are short, some are 16 sections, some go up to 75. But the sections are all vary in length. Some of them are like very short aphorisms, and some are kind of much longer, almost like philosophical sketches that he writes. Overall, there's 473 sections. Um, but this, all, this kind of structuring of the book, um, 
well into books um is a kind of to a degree is a later editorial fashioning because in the original version there's, they're not numbered they're just you know they're just paragraphs of sections i guess now that can sometimes be tricky because we don't know if actually one is actually not a new section but just meant to follow from the rest so i want you to think here of how um, imagine in your mind marcus writing this stuff on his military campaigns in a, a city in like central or eastern europe somewhere um and he's writing on scrolls and they're just these series of one kind of sen short sentences and he's writing to himself because no one this isn't for anybody else he doesn't want it to be published I mean, he doesn't destroy it either. He probably, if we can call us the, the Franz Kafka question, you might know of Kafka. He told his friend, best friend Max Brod, to burn all his works after he died, and Max Brod didn't. But did Kafka, when Kafka told Brod to do that, did he instruct him knowing that Brod would never burn it? Or not? It's quite, you know, do people, they claim not to be interested in posterity, but are they actually quite interested? We won't get an answer to this. Um, but yeah, the originals aren't numbered, the, the separation of the books comes later, um, and then there are a couple of places where we kind of know what's happening, um, his context, you know, when he's in different places, um, and that's mentioned in the book, but most of the time it's not. Okay, so, what kind of text are we dealing with in the meditations? Um, so, a mixture of styles. One thing that you might have noticed, especially if you've read the whole of the meditations, which I hope you would do, is that um, it has a tendency to be a bit repetitive. Sometimes this, this can just be in the imagery, often talk, uses the image of a river, which comes from Heraclitus. Um, but often the kind of the instructions to himself are repetitive and you kind of sometimes think, OK, now come on, we've read this before. Now, I want to defend the repetitive nature of this book because um, it reflects its purpose. Remember, it's not written for a wider literary audience. It's the book is written to himself and it should be seen as um, a series of spiritual exercises. I'm using the term spiritual exercise from a great historian of Marcus Aurelius, um, a Frenchman called Pierre Hadot. And we'll talk about him more a bit later. Um, that this is these, these scrolls, these notebooks are of a man who is kind of writing down and and interrogating himself and admonishing himself in the way that Epictetus encouraged it, encouraged his students to do. That's why sometimes he needs to remind himself of things that he shouldn't take for granted or he shouldn't uh, be, um, he shouldn't enjoy the, um, the um, I don't know, the prestige or the, the puffery of power, the bells and whistles of power too much. Um, so see this as so, as something as a as somebody working on themselves, interrogating themselves. Um, there's a Greek word here, uh, hippomnimata, hippomnimata, memory aids. Uh, you, somebody's writing this work as notes to oneself and things that one should remember, thoughts that one that you've had over the day, uh, reflections on rereading certain things or or. Um, reliving certain experiences in your mind in order to better understand them there's actually a culture of this in the roman world we'll talk about this in a second um again this format of it admonishing and interrogating yourself does to a degree come from epictetus more in, it comes up more in epictetus discourses um about these various things that you know the aspiring philosopher should do um and one of them is actually to write to write daily not write to write like in a notebook write for oneself you might think in like a diary, kind of like a diary, but you're not like going over external events, but you're managing your own perceptions and impressions. Um, and these are kind of tests that you should undertake. Can we get this? Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a quote from Epictetus here. Um, Epictetus says that these are the thoughts that those who pursue philosophy should ponder. 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 <laughs> These are the lessons they should write down day by day. In these, they should exercise themselves. So there's an exercise. Exercise is going on. Keep in mind, askesis, the Greek word from the Greek Stoics, that Stoic philosophy is a form of exercise, a form of training. And there are different analogies for this. Uh, in the first week, or for the first two weeks, it was in terms of dancing, Cicero dancing, you know, becoming a really good dancer, knowing the rhythm, being a good actor, being a good archer, being a good wrestler. All of these involve training in different ways. And how do you train if you're going to be a Stoic philosopher? Well, it's not just about rehearsing 
arguments, which is a big part of what they did at Epictetus School. It's about this work that you do on yourself on a daily basis. And that's what, and we should see the meditations as part of this. It is a stoic work just by its very format. Okay. Um, and here is Seneca. What's Seneca got to tell us? Um, yeah, it's Seneca also kind of fits into this brief of, um, of admonishing oneself. So Seneca says, we should see to it that whatever we have absorbed should not be allowed to remain unchanged or it will be no part of us. We must digest it. Otherwise, it will merely enter the memory and not the reasoning power. So it's kind of, I'll give you the quote, that's it. So this kind of digesting, chewing over, reflecting. Reflecting is something that is active. It's not just um, about um, thinking of things in your mind. It's about questioning, did you do the right thing? By what values were you acting? And the exhortation of Epictetus last week, prohiresis, um, was your will uh, in harmony with nature? I know in the discussions last week we were frustrated about what nature might mean in that sense. And just to keep in mind here, that the Stoics in the Stoic school, schools um, were, of course, very interested in physics and very interested in natural science. So when they talk about living in harmony with nature, it's living according to what they observe as the general rules of how living beings exist, which is that they preserve themselves, they preserve their own constitution, and what it means then for a human being to preserve their own constitution and live well to live in a healthy way, to live in a way that involves not happiness, because these guys aren't about happiness, about contentment, about detachment, tranquility of mind. I haven't mentioned here about where um, where Marcus gets his Stoic philosophy from. You know, it doesn't just land into his brain. Um, he's interested in philosophy from a fairly young age. He has a painter, it's a guy teaching him painting, I'm going to get his name wrong, so I apologise. I think it's Diogenes. Um, teach, introduces him to Stoic philosophy. And then Marcus, from, as a young man from the age of 12 onwards, is really like wowed by Stoic philosophy. He, start, he starts wearing a philosopher's cloak. He wants to sleep on bare wooden boards. He wants to live in a frugal way, an ascetic way. And, this can, and then he decides that he's going to abandon the um, study of rhetoric. You know, it's a shame. Um, you know, that, well, this, we have the same dilemma with Seneca. His, Seneca's father was, a, was a, an expert in rhetoric and Seneca unfortunately remains quite wedded to rhetoric. Sometimes it seems that his stoicism is mere rhetoric because he doesn't live it. Now Marcus in his own way as emperor kind of lives it I suppose um, but Marcus makes a big deal about how he, did, he had no time for poetry and rhetoric. He's not interested in flowery prose he wants to he wants to kind of the um, the inconvenient truth in different ways and it's not a truth about other people it's about a truth about your own mortality and your own self anyway I, i'm waffling um an important meeting for him is this guy called uh, rusticus junius rusticus who is a stoic a stoic teacher and he has a big influence on marx's life and there's a lot of praise for rusticus in the first book of the meditations and here is epictetus as well um, just thinking about this whole self admonishing structure. I mean, Epictetus does get mentioned in meditations a couple of times, but I guess what I would say here, keep in mind here the format of the meditations, and in particular, book one, the way that it begins on a series of points of gratitude, of saying thanks to different people in Marcus's life. Now, philosophers are praised, people like Rusticus who taught him, but also Marcus had a number of advisors who were also philosophers. They're thanked in quite clear terms as well. And then Antoninus Pius, and then the gods are thanked at the end. But rather than just saying, isn't this interesting that he's thanking some some specific historical individuals, the point that I think you should take home with this is that um, the necessity of beginning with gratitude, that the, the spiritual exercises and working on yourself, and let's, if you want to give this a modern inflection, the psychological um work that we would do on ourselves today um, begins on a point of humility of anti-egoism we could say um, of recognizing that everything that's good in your life comes because of other people I think that's a striking way that this begins I didn't want to get I didn't want to set this to the reading because I, I knew some of you might find it a little bit boring or you would be a bit unclear about why it's there but just keeps in mind I think it's very important that it begins like this 
Let's hear from Michel Foucault. I bet you weren't expecting to hear from him, were you, on the Stoics course? But that is because we often have the impression that the Stoics um, are kind of, is a slightly kind of conservative, reactionary, fogeyish, boring philosophy. And this is a shame that we sometimes get this impression. And I think part of it comes from the fact that Stoic philosophy is often embra embraced by people on the political right nowadays. Um, who take from it very, um, you know, very banal um, platitudes, like mind hacks and things like this. Actually, Foucault, towards the end of his life, does a lot of work on Stoic philosophy. You know, when, when he's doing, so Foucault, you know, um, if you want to know more about Foucault, if you don't know much about Foucault, send me an email because I recorded a lecture on Foucault introducing him. And I'll be very happy to share this with you. Um, Foucault, um, a major French figure over the 20th century, Towards the very end of his life, he works on his sixth volume, History of Sexuality. Uh, and then what he does, he never finishes it because he dies of AIDS. Um, but in the volumes two and three, unless he, fin he doesn't really finish three, uh, he's looking at this idea of the care of the self, of self-care and self-writing. And when he's talking about what it means to be oneself and writing the self, who does he turn to? Well, he, he turns to a, a range of people, so I wouldn't oversell this guy, but he turns to Marcus Aurelius, and he's got a lot of interesting things to say about Marcus Aurelius. Um, here, this is Foucault talking about the remarkable structure of the meditations as a form of um, hypomnimata, of memory aids. Foucault, quote, this, okay, let me just explain. He's saying about what the memory aids are for. Quote, one wrote down quotes in them, extracts from books, examples and actions that one had witnessed or read about, reflections or reasonings that one had heard or that had come to mind. They constituted a material record of things read, heard or thought, thus offering them up as a kind of accumulated treasure for subsequent rereading and meditation. And then Foucault then goes on to say about why would people use these notes? There's all sorts of purposes, and it's an interesting one he suggests here, um, about how we struggle with negative passions. Remember, our Stoics are striving for apatheia, which is an absence of negative emotions. It's not an absence of all emotions. It's an absence of negative emotions. Remember, we even see this in the beginning with Zeno. The goal is joy, but it's not happiness. It's not pleasure, I should say. It's joy, it's not pleasure. Foucault, quote, in which one presented arguments and means for struggling against some weakness, such as anger, envy, gossip, flattery, or for overcoming some difficult circumstance, a grief, an exile, ruin, or disgrace. Some of this will be reminiscent of Seneca too. Now, a great work on the meditations is by Pierre Hadot, The Inner Citadel, and it's full of all sorts of very interesting points. So if you really liked the, the reading, then the next step is to read the entire meditations. Um, and then I think the next step after that will be to read this book. So Haddo talks about the, the merits of this. Um, and this is wonderful. This is what Haddo here is talking about how we should consider this um, world literature. Remember, he's, you know, he's, he's bought into it. So have I. You might not have bought into it yet. So let's keep trying to persuade you. Haddo. Could we not say that if this book is still so attractive to us, it is because when we read it, we get the impression of encountering not the Stoic system, although Marcus constantly refers to it, but a man of goodwill who does not hesitate to criticise and to examine himself, who constantly takes up again the task of exhorting and persuading himself and of finding the words which will help him to live and to live well. In world literature, we find lots of preachers, lesson givers and censors who moralise to others with complacency, irony, cynicism or bitterness. But it is extremely rare to find a person training himself to live and to think like a human being. And it's this here, Haddo kind of sees in what Marx is offering him. A, a, I guess a kind of modesty, but it's just kind of it's a it's a, a remarkably surprising humility as well. As somebody who looks in the mirror and wants to kind of think about what's there, warts and all. Okay, um let's step away from the brainwashing part and talk about some specific arguments uh, that are happening in the meditations. Okay, so um in the next two parts um, we're going to look at um, 
the training in terms of becoming detached from others, which um, is going to involve um, a kind of contempt for the body and a, and a kind of coldness. And then we're going to look at duty and the politics that then arises out of the meditations. It's a kind of subtle politics, but it's politics of duty and of um, interdependence and collectivity um, shrouded in this kind of idea of, of being one off, being one off nature and one with nature. Right, let's look, talk about the inner citadel first. So, this. Um, what these spiritual exercises are encouraging us to do is reach a state of detachment in which we can recognize things for what they are and in which we are not so caught up by our impressions. Greek fantasia, this is one of the things that Epictetus is trying to train us to be able to control. So that through this detachment, we can think more clearly, we can achieve a state of mental tranquility. How are we going to get that? Well, we need to find a place within. We can't go on holiday to um, Bali or somewhere and expect enlightenment. The, the place of serenity is, is, is a state of mind that you can cultivate in any location. So let's hear, I'll, I'll, let's hear Marcus. Um, this is from chapter four, which is one part of the readings I set you this week. Quote, people try to get away from it all, to the country, to the beach, to the mountains. You always wish that you could too, which is idiotic. You can get away from it any time you like by going within. Nowhere you can go is more peaceful, more free of interruptions than your own soul, especially if you have other things to rely on. An instant's recollection, and there it is, complete tranquillity. And by tranquillity, I mean a kind of harmony. So keep getting away from it all like that. Renew yourself. But, but, keep it brief and basic. A quick visit should be enough to ward you. Don't spend too much time, um, as we might, this is an analogy to Harry Potter, um, staring into the into the mirror, you know, looking into the, being deluded by these kind of fictions or daydreams of, of the past. Don't become so locked away in your own citadel that you are unable to act capably and uh, compassionately in the here and now. Just a quick visit. Now, just as a quick reference, we're going to look at Montaigne in a few weeks alongside Shakespeare, and he talks about cultivate, cultivating a, a back room, cultivating a place of quiet detachment, and here it is. There's other parts in chapter, in book A of Meditations, and whatever similar things. So what else are we going to get with this training? Well, there's first this. The first location, we could say, is this, the inner citadel, the tower. But then the second, okay, this, here's a quote, um, then the second is um, it's taking a different kind of view, and it's, um, it's a view from space, if that makes sense. So it's like a view, it's a view from space, or um, it's a view from a great height. The view from above, let's call it that. And Marcus also wants us to kind of imagine this, that we can fly up above the Earth. And when we fly up above the Earth, we can see that um, all of these regional conflicts, these wars, they're kind of meaningless, you know, one nation or enough uh, from a massive height, people just look like ants, buildings are insignificant, and not much really matters. We actually get this sort of view from above, thought experiment, in Seneca, in the natural questions, where he talk, you know, but Marcus presents it beautifully. I'll give you just one example, actually I'll give you a couple, because it's, it's, it's an important thing, and then I'll, I'll start explaining the rationale for this. So he asks, he's, remember he's admonishing himself, this is a book to himself, quote, or is it your reputation that's bothering you? But look at how soon we're all forgotten. The abyss of endless time that swallows it all. The emptiness of all those applauding hands. The people who praise us, how capricious they are, how arbitrary. And the tiny region in which it all takes place. The whole earth a point in space. And most of it uninhabited. How many people there will be to admire you and who they are. So keep this refuge in mind, the back roads of yourself. This is from uh, section three of book four. It's very interesting, there's two different images there, the back roads of yourself, the refuge, the back roads, the inner place, as a way of cultivating detachment, to not get too caught up by the applauding hands, by the vanity that, and vain glory of power. And here's 
sorry. Uh, I've had fun finding these gifts uh, this week. Um, now this could give it the the book a slightly repetitive quality, at least with this image, because he comes back to it in a couple of other places in book six and book nine, the view from above, what it means to adopt this as a thought experiment. In book six, he says, Asia and Europe, distant recesses of the universe, the ocean, a drop of water, Mount Athos, a molehill, the present, a split second in eternity, minuscule, transitory, insignificant. So it's just admonishing that Asia and Europe are the, um, the crucible of the Roman Empire, places that the empire is struggling to control all the time. Marcus says they're just distant recesses of the universe. Yes, he has this role. Yes, he is emperor. And yes, he feels this immense sense of duty. Um, but in the cosmic scheme of things, it's, it's fairly, it's meaningless. What matters is this present. What matters is how you act reasonably and responsibly. In book nine, he comes back to the same image again. To see, quote, the, to see them from above, the thousands of animal herds, the rituals, the voyages on calm or stormy seas, the different ways we come into the world, share it with one another and leave it. Consider the lives led once by others long ago, the lives to be led by others after you, the lives led even now in foreign lands. How many people don't even know your name? How many will soon have forgotten it? How many, how many who, who praise you now and, and tomorrow perhaps contempt? That to be remembered is worthless, like fame, like everything. To be, to be remembered is worthless. So you may know this work already. Uh, the English uh, 17th century doctor Thomas Brown um, writes a, a wonderful work called, called Urn Burial in the 17th century. And that invokes a similar imagery. Most families will not last three oaks. It's a similar sense of grounding oneself in the presence because immortality is impossible. Urn burial is a, is a, a beautiful work to compare with this. Let's get back to Marcus. So in a hot air balloon. Actually, this is sitting. I didn't mean, mean to make the Thomas Brown link. It just came to mind. Um, but we looked last week at Vanitas imagery in early modern Europe. You now the abundance and splendor, the riches of life, the coins down there, the music, happiness in the present. But the skull, <laughs> prominent, of course. Pleasures are fleeting. Life does not last long in this imagery. Remember, it, it usually comes from, from the Dutch Golden Age, a very Calvinistic society, which is also incredibly wealthy. Creates a lot of uh, internal challenges about how you should behave. You want to enjoy it, but not too much. But it's these reminders, and it's interesting that maybe how Marcus is, becomes an important source as the Seneca um, at a time where there are riches and splendor and so forth. What we get in many parts of the meditations, and this, when I was um, rereading this again and taking notes on the text, this is something that I ended up taking most notes on, is the vanity of the world, the vanity of life. And there's a lot on this. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to quote you all of the instances because there's too many, but I'm just going to, if we go through a couple of bits of this, um, about what, what they tell us. Um, this actually is a long quote from Book 4, uh, Section 32. And here we get the kind of the familiar, what we can now tell are the familiar elements of, of what Marx is doing. There is the self interrogation, there is the um, emphasis on seeing everything as transient and passing. And then there's this kind of emphasis on understanding and re understanding and rem remembering as a memory aid so that one could not get too caught up in these distractions. Marx says survey the records of other eras. And see how many others gave their all and soon died and decomposed into the elements that formed them. But most of all, run through the list of those you knew yourself, those who worked in vain, who failed to do what they should have, what they should have remained fixed on and found satisfaction. He goes on. What is eternal fame? Emptiness. Then what should we work for? This is interesting because... Again, keep in mind Camus and the myth of Sisyphus, keep in mind the existential tradition that you could take this stuff and you could say, right, this is, as Camus says, this is the silent, uncaring universe. But look, look at what Marcus draws out. In this next sentence, next couple of sentences, we're going to get the difference between Stoicism and existentialism. Then what should we work for? Only this, proper understanding, unselfish action, truthful speech. 
a resolve to accept whatever happens as necessary and familiar, flowing like water from that same source and spring. Then water analogy, we've got more to say about this. Marcus continues, our lifetime is so brief. And to live it out in these circumstances among these people in this body, there's nothing to get excited about. Consider the abyss of time past, the infinite future. Three days of life or three generations, what's the difference? So, I mean, there's two different ways that we could look at this. Some of you might be thinking, well, this is almost, this is killjoyish, you know, this is kind of suffocating the pleasures of life. You know, how can we enjoy life if we assume, you know, that nothing, that, you know, our lives are very short and it doesn't matter if we live for another 20 years or another two years or what have you. Isn't Mar Why does Marcus distrust pleasure so much? You might be feeling suspicious there. But others of you might be thinking, ha, this is very interesting, because when we think of our Roman emperors and the splendour and gluttony and luxury of being the tyrants of, a, of an extremely unequal society, it's very curious that this kind of writing appears, and appears so often. What's, what's this training kind of trying to tell us? It seems even more striking that it comes from an emperor. So we get this too in what the meditations have to say about the human body. Again, quite distrustworthy. There's a wonderful phrase, Marcus d d describes the body as this battered crate. The body is something that is transient, it's passing, but not only that, it's something that we should really distrust, sometimes in quite a horrible way. And this comes up in a couple of places. I'll mention them, and then I'm gonna we're gonna just briefly mention Martha Nussbaum, brilliant philosopher. Um, so let's talk about how how Marcus distances himself from the body. Well, he does it in one place. It's from Book Six, where he's talking about a feast, and now everything in this feast, we should imagine that it's all rotting. You get it. this is kind of reminiscent actually of the Dutch Golden Age imagery as well, of rotting fruit and so on. Marcus quote: "This is a dead fish." A dead bird, a dead pig, or that this noble vintage is grape juice and the purple robes a sheep wool dyed with shellfish blood. Or making love, something rubbing against your penis, a brief seizure and a little cloudy liquid. It's kind of brutally unsentimental. It's, you know, it's kind of gross, we might say. Let's Enough a bit from book two. Um, Marcus, instead... As if you were dying right now, despise your flesh. A mess of blood, pieces of bone, a woven tangle of nerves, veins, arteries. So how do we, I mean, this, this is a remarkable thought experiment here. That in the midst of the feast, imagine everything is rotting. See it in terms of the elements that make, up, make it up. When you look at your own body, do not adore it. Imagine that it is rotting in front of you. Everything is transient. This is the more extreme end of detachment. It's total detachment from the body. And actually, we might be able to draw some useful comparisons here with the Dhammapada when we look at the Buddha in a couple of weeks' time. It's not quite in the same way. It doesn't quite use imagery like this. But this is, there you often get this idea that the body is like a carriage or a coach. You know, it's, you know, it, might, it, can, it can be painted and beautiful like a royal carriage, but it's, it's a physical object and it doesn't, it's not real compared to the real us, which is the thinking mind. We get this in book three, Marcus has enough of, it's a phrase that comes quickly, but it's, keep it in mind. This is a, he's talking about the mind versus the body. One is mind and spirit, the other earth and garbage. Spirit versus shit. What do we pursue? Sensual pleasures, food, feasting, sex. Marcus is wary of this. He's wary because they're transient, because they serve to disturb the tranquility of the mind. Now, when Martha Nussbaum talks about Marcus Aurelius, um, she's worried that there's something um, in this detachment which is not just too unsentimental, but um, it almost um, it violates um, the. From, um, this is more my words than hers. Um, the goodness or, or the beauty of the human condition as well. 
that there's something almost kind of savage, there's kind of violence here inf inflicted on the body, on one's own body in this in this kind of work. And it's not especially helpful for ethical living because we shouldn't hate the body, we shouldn't hate our own bodies, um, and we shouldn't become too alienated from our own bodies. You know, this can have all sorts of negative effects on our own sense of who we are. It can make us very repressed and very unhappy. And I think there is something that's something important in what Martha Nussbaum is saying there. Maybe this goes too far. What I would say is to kind of countenance this a little bit is that these are spiritual exercises, these are personal exercises. Sometimes they come across very strong. And this is somebody who I, I take into almost be seat belting, maybe even straight jacketing himself against temptations and pleasures. But it would be unfair to conclude that this is somebody who hates life or hates the body. This isn't a life denying morality, as Friedrich Nietzsche would say. Let's look at a little bit from book two. This is not from book two, this is just some people feasting. <laughs> no, um, but this is my familiarity. This is where Marx is talking about um, how our brief mortality, but then he gets somewhere interesting. It's not just, you know, whining and, and you know, and disgust. He says, life, quote, duration, momentary, nature, changeable, perception, dim, condition of body, decaying, soul, spinning around, fortune, unpredictable, lasting fame, uncertain. Sum up. The body and its parts are a river, the soul, a dream and mist, life is war and a journey far from home. Lasting reputation is oblivion. Then what can guide us? Only philosophy. Only philosophy. So there's something, folks, in case you're you're worrying here. Um, and in fact, this is what we're going to get to when we start talking about duty in a moment. There are some very powerful remarks about how we can live and how we can use this detachment not just to... Um, to kind of um, not lose our heads at the symposium like in this image here. But to kind of live, to kind of, to be better human beings, to be better friends, better partners, to have, a, to have greater self-knowledge. And this, and this came up in the discussions last week, can be a very useful condition to then acting ethically or politically thereafter. But first, we need self-knowledge. And with that, we need compassion too. So there are these kind of remarks about not getting too um, desirous of living forever and lasting forever, not being too concerned about posterity, knowing that even the greatest empires will rise and fall, as so they do spectacularly with the Roman Empire. And at times, actually, Marcus is quite funny about this. You know, he's quite um, amusing in how um, he kind of says, you know, like, you know, why do you want to be remembered, really? You know, like, who's going who's gonna to be remembering us? It's from book six, he says, no, but to be admired by posterity, people they've never met and never will, that's what they set their hearts on. So he's talking about us at ambitious people. But you might as well be upset at not being a hero to your great grandfather. You I mean you're never gonna meet these people who you you wish your name to live on to. Anyway, it could be even worse. This is from book eight. People out for posthumous fame forget that the generations to come will be the same annoying people. <laughs> They know now. So there's that. But there's also something else too that, you know, great things disappear because so much that happens in life and in society and politics is out of our control. Great libraries like that, Alexandria, will be destroyed. Remarkable monuments like those at Palmyra will be destroyed by fanatics. So what do we do? And how do we avoid just sinking back into the pessimism that's what i love about marcus it's not sinking there it's going somewhere different it ends up leading to an outlook on nature so these two quotes i've given you this next remark it comes in the context of you know not of you know being skeptical about posterity but it, it then goes somewhere different so he's talking about alexander the great here remember alexander the great there's that famous anecdote with diogenes the cynic and uh Alexander meets Diogenes who lives in a barrel, of course he does, um, 
and he says to him, you know, I'll give you anything you want, what do you want? And he says, get out of my way, you know, because he's sunbathing and Alexander and his entourage are obscuring the sun. So Alexander is, you know, he's almost a stock figure of someone who is rebuked by the philosopher. And here it happens with Marcus. Marcus says, Alexander the Great and his mule alike into the life force of the world or dissolved alike into atoms. You'd be thinking of him, that's strange. He's either dissolved in, well, they're both either dissolved into the life force, into a, a unity, a oneness, or they're dissolved into many different atoms. And you get a few different points in the meditations where there's a kind of, Marx is not really sure about, you know, what universe is made up of. Either it's a kind of cosmic oneness, as per the Stoic tradition, or it's made up of atoms, um, and it's kind of more meaningless, which is what you get in the Epicurean tradition from Democritus. He, he kind of, he hedges his bets. Anyway, a recurring image in this is of the river. Here is a river. Now, the image of things being like a river comes from Heraclitus, um, someone who came before Socrates, so we call him a pre-Socratic, um, who was described later as the crying or the weeping philosopher because he tended to take you know, a, quite a pessimistic and misanthropic look at life. He thought that life, you know, all existence is defined by con conflict, by fire, by flux. Famously, we never step into the same river twice because everything's flowing and becoming something different. And this imagery of the river comes up a lot in the meditations. It is an allusion to Heraclitus. Just a few examples. From book four, time is a river, a violent current of events. Book five, existence flows past us like a river, not even what's right here. The infinity of past and future gates before us, a chasm whose depths we cannot see. Book nine, the design of the world is like a flood, sweeping all before it. The foolishness of them, little men busy with affairs of state, with philosophy, or what they think of as philosophy. Nothing but phlegm and mucus. Okay, right, there's the body hating Marcus coming back in again. Um, but again, we see this is a, a flood, a, a violent river. Something flowing. We had the imagery of, of flowing, flowing water in Seneca in, in on the shortness of life. It's a very important stoic imagery. But we also get here, and this is in book ten, the imagery of leaves. He said, Marcus talks about his own children being like leaves, leaves that are just blown away. He quotes a poet, leaves that the wind drives earthward, such are the generations of men. Things that are here and then quickly snuffed out or taken away tomorrow. We know that Marcus encountered this in his own life with his own children. But as somebody, somebody being a very, you know, as far as he saw, a very conscientious, duty-driven emperor, fighting in legions and seeing his own men and people that he valued dying, his own wife dies before he does, like leaves. Is that a detachment that is too cold? Or is this somebody struggling with pain and yet still able to um, pull out of the... Um, the murk and the violence of life and adversity. Quite a compelling and beautiful image of the harmony of nature. I think it's the latter. <laughs> what I'm meant to be persuading you of. Okay, so we've talked about detachment in this section. Let's move on. Let's talk about duty. Let's talk about the, the ethics and the politics that might arise out of what Marcus is saying. So at the very beginning of this course, um, I outlined what I consider to be free uh, principles of, of, of a stoic outlook and I didn't these weren't just based on my own thoughts about Greek and Roman stoicism but out of the wider stoic tradition that as I identify it and as I'm teaching on this course which ends up involving different religions and different cultures now a key one was self-knowledge but then the next was compassion and I think we didn't, there wasn't often that much compassion in Epictetus. You know, it's a kind of Epictetus' handbook. It's a working on oneself, um, looking at your wife and child like a jerk. There was a lot of objections to this uh, last week. Um, but there is a lot of compassion in Marcus. Let's take a look at some of it. Now, it, we, can, we can work with the very beginning of the, well, it's not the very beginning, the very beginning of book two, I should say, of the reading of the meditations. 
And it's interesting. This is um, an extract which at first seems like it's going to involve this kind of coldness and, you know, like fuck other people. You know, you can't trust other people. But then it ends up, again, you get this, it's almost it's a recurring direction in Marx's reasoning. It flows from contempt to compassion. Let's see it. Let's see the process in work. It begins. When you wake up in the morning, tell yourself, the people I deal with today will be meddling, ungrateful, arrogant, dishonest, jealous and surly. Hopefully this won't be the same for you when you wake up tomorrow morning. Okay, so it sounds like misanthropy, doesn't it? Here comes the development. Marcus. They are like this because they can't tell good from evil. But I... Missed a word out here. But I have seen that they have a nature related to my own, not of the same blood or birth, but the same mind, and possessing a share of the divine. And so none of them can hurt me. None of them can imp implicate me in ugliness. So he recognises when people are pissing him off um, and letting him down or trying to deceive him some way that they, may, they are like him. They have the same body, the same mind, the same share of the divine. We'll get to this in a moment. We're not going to, you know, we're not going to avoid this. This is about being part of parts of the same whole. But then Marcus says that they can't hurt him. Here, I encourage you to keep in mind the the key remark of Socrates for the Stoic tradition that a good man cannot be harmed. That once we understand things, we can control our own opinions or judgments about them, so we won't get pissed off and angry at people just being people. Marcus quote: Nor can I feel angry at my relative or hate him. We were born to work together like feet, hands and eyes, like the two rows of teeth, upper and lower. So we get this often in in the meditations, and this is something that I want us to spend a bit of time on. So just as there is a Marx has a lot to say about um, about the vanity of the world, he also has a lot to say about the parts and the whole, of being parts in the whole, of being limbs of one body. And that, I mean, so one thing that we haven't seen with Epictetus, we didn't see it with Epictetus at all, and we're not really seeing it much with Marcus, is an interest in physics. Remember the three topoi of the Stoics? Ethics, logic, physics. There is a physics here. There is a, there is a view of nature here, of this one collective being. You actually get this quite interestingly in Spinoza later on, of being all part of one universe, being all modes in one substance. I don't know. I don't want to push the Marcus influence. Let's look at how the part and the whole work. So this is just something that I found. A gif um, not from Marcus. But let's look at some remarks that Marcus makes. I'm going to start with ones that we get um, from your reading. So this is from book two, section three. Marcus says, and then, and then there is necessity in the needs of the whole world of which you are a part. Whatever the nature of the whole does and whatever serves to maintain it is good for every part of nature. The world is maintained by change in the elements and in the things they compose. Okay, so the, the emphasis on change, flow, this is how it clients, it's the river and so on. Everything is changing, everything's in flux, all things in flux. But rather than this pointing to a disorderly picture, it's interesting how Marcus is drawn towards order. This is from book four, section 40. The world is a living being, one nature, one soul. Keep that in mind. And how everything feeds into that single experience, moves with a single motion, and how everything helps produce everything else, spun and woven together. So like I said, this is this is the Stoic physics at work. I think this is we had this in week two. The different ways in which the Stoics describe the interrelation of the two. One is like the egg, you know, like, you know, the, you have the egg shell, the egg white, and the egg yolk, and then another is like the field, and then the, you know the fruit that comes from the field, and so on. Marx's understanding of the universe as being a single living being with one nature, one soul, immediately tends into an ethical outlook in which. Um, he recognises all people as equal. He talks about the world being a city. And that because we're parts of the whole, we're all interconnected and we all serve an equally valuable role. 
and this can be good and it can be a kind of melancholic melancholic image at the same time he says that um what we are now the physical body that we occupy would would die it would decompose and it's parts will become parts of something else everything is transformed into another ad infinitum so what do we do with that marcus says this is book six keep reminding yourself of the way things are connected of their relatedness all things are implicated in one another and in sympathy with sympathy with each other this event is the consequence of some other one things push and pull on each other and breathe together and are one Flowing, becoming, breathing together, a kind of cosmic singularity. From book seven, quote, nature takes substance and makes a horse, like the horse in this Van Gogh image, like a sculptor with wax, and then melts it down and uses the material for a tree, then for a person, then for something else, each existing only briefly. So this is it, this is what we're dealing with. And there's all sorts of wonderful formulations of imagining this. At the very end of the meditations, life is a single thing that's distributed among a thousand different natures. Everything is interwoven and the web is holy. It's in book seven. Everything is connected. One world, one divinity, one substance, one law. The logos that all rational beings share. So keep in mind what logos means. Remember Marx is writing in Koine, Greek. And uh, logos can have different meanings, you know, it can be reason or law or even speech. Um, that there is this kind of single, singular reason that pervades the universe. All of this vanity, all of this death is also all of this life and all of this value. The training of the philosopher is to recognize what is valuable and to live in accordance with nature. And Marx's unique contribution to this is to think of ourselves as very small parts of nature. To not just maybe like atoms, but in places he says, let's go further. Let's match ourselves as being like limbs. There are other elements to this sense of duty too that we should draw out. So when we looked at Seneca, we looked at a great text by him on the shortness of life. And there's a lot of striking moments in on the shortness of life. Um, and I don't know, I mean, Marcus doesn't mention Seneca uh, in this work. Um, but there are lots of similar sentence, sen sentiments here about you know how we should make the most of the present, um, how we should um, avoid being too distracted by past and future. There's only one moment that we are in, and that is now. And part of what M Marcus wants us to do with accepting death is to kind of, like Seneca, is to value our lives and to not waste time as a result. And this happens in different ways. In book eight, he, he talks about how past or future can have no power over you. I don't think you imagine for us, in our lives, what would that mean? If we could ground our focus on the present so that the past didn't continually impinge on us in the form of memories or habits which maybe thwart us and make us unhappy. There's also the kind of the, um, the bodily detachment that Marcus does in other places when he talks about accepting death. In book seven he says, think of yourself as dead. You have lived your life, now take what's left and live it properly. He also says that we should understand and accept death in a cheerful spirit. So that we're gonna we're gonna rejoin this kind of singular natural unity that we've come from. Our body is just gonna change form. We are all eternal in that respect, but nothing is gonna we won't be remembered, and that's okay. In other places we can imagine um Marcus consoling himself. You remember that a lot of his children die, and so he talks about what you know, what you how you understand or grieve when somebody's sick or when somebody's dying in book eight he says the fact that my son is sick that i can see but that he might die of it no stick with first impressions to not worry about the future how can you not when your son is so ill that he will die in this case i imagine it must be one of his sons who did die well you concentrate and you grow you kind of attach you tether 
like Odysseus, your mind to the present. That's very hard. I don't think that's straightforward. Nonetheless, there is this kind of work of valuing the present now. So we've had this with the James Dean quote that comes up every so often in this course. Dream as if you'll live forever. Live as if you'll die today. I kind of might take it a good way of illustrating what Seneca's got to say. But when, this isn't going to lead us into uh, into hedonism. Because what Marcus is trying to direct us to with his philosophy is the pursuit of reason. That when we see life and death for what they are, when we see nature for what it is, then we can control our impressions. We can control the fantasiae. We can protect our mind from false perceptions. And it's going to lead us to a way of life. Let's use here the image of wrestling from Seneca, part of our training. That when we do this, these spiritual exercises, when we admonish ourselves, when we, we're, we're trying to get to a certain point. We're trying to live up to the four virtues of traditional Greek Stoic philosophy, which is justice, self-control, courage and honesty. We're going to live these values by doing this training. What we're aiming for is to achieve tranquility, tranquility of mind. But that's not just a kind of psychological state. Remember for Marcus, he's interested in what it would do for us in terms of how we live. He talks about he has in mind that a way of life defined by simplicity, humility, cheerfulness, serenity, acceptance. And acceptance comes up a lot. Accepting that things must be what they are. Accepting fate. Have in mind here Nietzsche's eternal recurrence or the idea of amor fati, love of fate, which you get in Eke Homo much later in Nietzsche's works. You know, Nietzsche can be quite dismissive of, of the Stoics, um, but there is a lot of his thinking which is, which is reminiscent of Stoic thought processes, a serenity that comes with detachment, with seeing things for what they are. These are the spiritual, this is part of the exercise, this is the training. There's different ways that we can categorise this. Two things that I'll just draw out briefly in terms of the what the, the exercises are going to do for us are um, accepting offers and then challenging ourselves. Let's look at them both in turn. So the meditations has a lot about accepting people because of their flaws and despite their flaws. Um, to recognise people as also human. In book seven, in this quote, he says that Quote, they act out of ignorance against their will. But again, he's not trying to blame. Remember, Epictetus has a long a running point about not blaming others. Marcus doesn't want us to blame other people for letting us down. We are flawed like them. We will be dead soon, like you know, just as they will be. It's silly, quote, it's silly to try to escape other people's faults. They are inescapable. Just try to escape your own. That's part of the training. And how do you train? You self-interrogate, you self-admonish. You, you do this spiritual bookkeeping. You have this journal in which you interrogate what you think. Self-admonition. You get this in a few different points of meditations. This is just a, a section of book 10. When faced with people's bad behaviour, turn around and ask when you have acted like that. When you saw money as a good or pleasure or social position. Your anger will subside as soon as you recognise that they acted under compulsion. What else could they do? So the goal then is understanding when we act under compulsion and how we control that, how we manage that. And in that sense, we get closer to an answer about what freedom involves for the Stoics, given that they view that the universe is, is determined, deterministic. What we can control is our own minds and our own understandings of events our own judgments, our own opinions, so that we in turn prevent, this is going to sound very spinose and sad passions from acting on us and then perpetuating them onto others, so that we modify our own reactions to things, even if most of these things are outside of our control, so that we can achieve a state of tranquility and we may end up living more ethically too, living more justly too. So this is Marcus. Now let's just turn briefly to a kind of politics that emerges and then we're going to talk about his legacy and then we better wrap up. Um, 
So in one part of the meditations, um, he talks about how we need to imagine ourselves as, as branches of a tree. And that we are part of one nature, and we are just one part of it, and we are valuable in the same way that everyone else is valuable. And in a couple of places, Marcus goes a bit further and he says, well, actually, um, we need to kind of, we need to recognize that all human beings are equal. That when we think of the nation state or the empire, this is a kind of arbitrary thing. It's not something that is real. or It's not something that's going to last for a long time. What matters is nature and the world. And so we are all citizens of the world. Remember, Theresa May would not have much time for this. We're talking about cosmopolitanism here, aren't we? Something that we attribute to Diogenes and the cynics, but comes up in Marcus as well. It doesn't come up in all the Stoics, but comes up in Marcus. It's interesting. It's multi head of a multinational, multi-ethnic, multi-religious empire. So what does our citizenship mean? Book four, quote. If thought is something we share, then so is reason. What makes us reasoning beings? If so, then the reason that tells us what to do and what not to do is also shared. And if so, we share a common law and thus a fellow citizens, and fellow citizens of something. And in that case, our state must be the world. What other entity could all of humanity belong to? Now, this isn't just kind of leading to a kind of, you know, we're all human beings, you know, some sort of stone detachment. It leads to a sense of duty about how the emperor must kind of act and protect others. So he says that my city and state are Rome, but as a human being, the world. Okay, this is from book six. Quote, so for me, good can only mean what's good for both communities. So he needs to act for Rome and act for the world. I don't know what he did for the world. Well, maybe this, this work is for the world. But there are these points and places about how you should act out of duty for others. How you need to, um, the thing that you should pursue is what benefits other people. Because if you're all citizens of the world, you're in one city. And polis, the Greek word polis, means city. Politics is, you know, something of the city. And so our entrance into politics and into political life is, is part of what benefits other people in the city, in the space that we share. Only a short time left. Live as if you were alone, out in the wilderness. No difference between here and there. The city that you live in is the world. Okay, right, um, so we're getting there now. Let's talk about his legacy. We're going to look at two different perspectives and then we're going to round up. So the first is kind of, um, actually, no, let's bring this up. This is from Rodin, it's The Thinker. Now, Rodin does a lot of different versions of The Thinker, and this one I like, but it wasn't appropriate for Epictetus at all. And this is where The Thinker is in front of the gates of hell and surrounded by, um, kind of by the misery and instability of human life. This is someone who thinks in the midst of society, in the midst of flux. I think this is where we should picture Marcus. Now, this isn't a quote from Rodin, but someone who sounds a bit similar, Ernest Renan, uh, who is a 19th century historian and somebody who reads in the meditations a kind of the, the noble outpourings or confessions of a tormented soul. He reads it in a quite romantic way. And so he makes, this is a quote, this quote actually comes from, it's from Renan, but it's, in the inner citadel by Pierre Hadot, and it's about the value of the meditations. The little box containing the meditations on the banks of the Grand the River, and the philosophy of Marcus Aurelius was saved. There came out of it this incomparable book in which Epictetus was surpassed, this manual of the resigned life, this gospel of those who do not believe in the supernatural, which has not been able to be understood until our own time. A true eternal gospel, the meditations will never grow old, for it affirms no dogma. The gospel has grown old in some of its parts. Science no longer allows the naive conception of the supernatural which constitutes its foundations. In the meditations, the supernatural is only a tiny insignificant stain which does not affect the wonderful beauty of the background. Science could destroy God and the soul, but the meditations would still remain young with life and truth. So for Renan, this is the best of world literature. Something that is timeless. Perhaps because of its, you know, its 
It speaks to human nature rather than the supernatural. In that sense, we could say too, a phrase that I used at the beginning, that it's a materialist work and it fits into a materialist tradition. It's one that makes the Stoics, even they do seem a, a bit easygoing nowadays, so radical in the time. That is so, there's very little here about the gods. There's very little, there's, there's no place for faith. You know, if we want to compare the Stoics to Christianity, this, I mean, what, and we'll look at this next week, we'll look at Ecclesiastes, and not that that's a Christian work. But there's little place for faith here. This is an emphasis on, on an active human mind, reasoning and understanding. Now, another image of Stoic philosophy from Epictetus is that it's medicine. It's a therapy, it's a therapeutics, it's going to heal the soul. And Epictetus's teachings are about healing other people's souls. His school is a doctor's clinic, you know, it's like going to the GP for your mind. Well, probably a lot better, <laughs> probably, unless you've had a, you've had a joy of having a better GP than me. Um, but there's something different that's happening with Marcus. He's not trying to heal other people's souls. He's managing his own. It's, it's an, a series of admonishments to himself, something that we've talked about a lot already. There is one now. But Hegel, on the right, thinks differently, a bit more sceptical. He thinks that the Stoic philosophy and that of Marcus reflects um, a time of slavery. And it's a time that, um, and it ultimately its teachings are not very useful because they don't emphasise an active life. Actually, you get this a little bit of Hannah Arendt much later when she talks about the value of the vita activa, the active life, and how the vita contemplativa, the contemplative life, um, was very harmful for politics because it meant that people didn't value pub public life. So Hannah Arendt wouldn't like Marcus Aurelius in that respect, nor does Hegel. Let's listen to Hegel. This is from the Phenomenology of Spirit. Hegel says, of the Stoic works, quote, they could only appear on the scene in a time of universal fear and bondage, whether on the throne or in chains, in the utter dependence of its individual existence. Its aim is to be free and to maintain that lifeless indifference which steadfastly withdraws from the bustle of existence. So it's useful, but it's limited. Now, is this steadfast withdrawal from, bustle, from the bustle of existence someone that's going to ultimately be counterproductive for us living active lives? I don't think so. I completely disagree with Hegel there. I think this kind of work, this kind of spiritual or psychological work, this, that someone that's active, that in, it, it involves self-interrogation, um, and which is critical of oneself and what one thinks, I think this serves immense uses nowadays. The need to kind of build and cultivate an inner citadel and protect it. And to not do it in a, in a solipsistic way, which involves us being detached or us being um, deluded that we are somehow great or we are somehow special. Remember, there's, Marcus's running point is that there's nothing special about us. And that's actually, that's a consoling, that's a blessing. It means that we can appreciate everyone around us and everything around us, even when it's harmful to us. There's some other curious reasons this as Renan, reads it in a romantic way. In the 20th century, you start getting people looking at this work, not in terms of philosophy, but in terms of like Freud and psychology. Um, you know, they, they, did Marcus only write this stuff because he had bad, he had lots of ulcers? Thomas Africa says, you know, is this only, this is because he was an opium addict? I just don't see that. I mean, come on, think about somebody smoking opium. Would they have written this much in this way? Um, and nowadays on their own, you know, impoverished time uh, you have lots of people um, looking at this stuff um, in a very um, instrumental but you know kind of bankrupt way um, there's one guy I'm not going to give you his name um, talks about what Marcus will say is part of the tools of the Titans this is a guy who writes about the, the you know the, 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 the ways in which successful billionaires operate and how us merely us lowly mortals can learn from them I don't see this as tools of times or, or mind hacks. You get this Massimo Piglucci, Ryan Holiday. They read, um, and I really don't like this way of looking at the Stokes at all. Um, they they take all of the context and all of the past out of these thinkers, and they kind of present them for people that want to go to the gym and get promotions at work. I don't think Marcus would um, support such a, a vain way of using philosophy either. But is it philosophical enough? 
or maybe it's it should be better seen as literature as world literature that's a question that you can help me understand i'm not i'm unclear on this i think it's both i'm not sure if it if it maybe fulfills what we're looking for in terms of a rigorous systemic systematic philosophy although there's not much from this time that really offers that apart from plato and aristotle which survives but i think there is a philosophy here but in terms of literature and of self-writing i think it's pretty extraordinary stuff okay let's start wrapping up so when we meet on monday in our large group i want us to look at these questions i want us as a whole group to discuss what the purpose of the meditations is now it doesn't tell us we don't know what its purpose is so we're going to need to discuss this what do you think marx's purpose is in writing this what's he trying to do then in smaller groups we're going to we're going to explore what, what characterizes the perspective of marcus here i want you to think about the material on detachment and duty and then lastly how do we categorize this work is it literature or is it philosophy what do we do with it how do we live with it discuss one to three on zoom and then for next week um we're looking at the book of ecclesiastes <laughs> you might be thinking oh uh, it's a strange one isn't it to choose this because there's very little writing about ecclesiastes in terms of philosophy because you know it's not you know it's not it's not this isn't stoic work um it's not really even considered a work of philosophy it's from the old testament um but i want us to consider it as a work of philosophy i want us to look at it as a form of stoic writing but something that is different from stoic writing so it's traditionally um for like king solomon why is king solomon was the author in the ninth century but nowadays we don't think this so we written, we think it's written in the third fourth century bc which is like the same time that zeno and others emerge actually which is interesting i want us to look at the king james version because it's beautiful uh, but also so that we can see the inflections of this later. Once you read Ecclesiastes, the King James Version, you might have done so already, you'll, you'll, you'll realise that it gets quoted a lot in other places. It's really, really interesting. Okay, that's me. Thanks very much, everyone.